Hi everyone, welcome to our second lesson, which is on basic chemistry. Again, some of this will be a review for you, so please let me know if I end up going too slow or too fast for any of the concepts. You can always contact me in the Remind app. So first off, when we talk about chemistry, a term that you hear a lot is matter. And matter is defined as anything that has mass and occupy space. And the way that it occupies that space can be in any of the three following states. So it can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. And which of these it is depends on how fast its atoms are moving and how spread apart they are. So a solid will be made up of matter in which the atoms are moving very slow and they're very close together. Whereas liquid, the matter starts moving faster and the atoms start getting more spread out. And then gas, gas is the form where that matter, the atoms making it up, will be spread far, far apart from each other. And that's why, you know, gas can take up the form of whatever object it's in because the atoms are so spread out apart from each other, then it can take up a whole room if it wanted to. Now, when we talk about matter, it's usually composed of 92 naturally occurring elements. And when we say elements, these are basically um, forms of matter that have a very specific chemical and physical property to them. And an element cannot be broken down into smaller substances that would maintain those specific chemical or physical properties. And the six most important ones for us are what we can basically call schnapps. So the six most important elements for us are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And again, you can remember it as schnapps or however you want to uh, arrange those letters like ponches or something. Um, and with these different elements, they're going to make up the bulk of the, the body weight of living things. Okay, so that's why I said they're the most important for biology, because they make up the bulk of living things. Now, I mentioned atoms in the previous slide, and what atoms are, are the smallest unit of an element, which still displays the properties of that element. And you have three subatomic particles making up an atom. There's going to be protons, neutrons, and electrons. And it's very important to be able to distinguish them. So when you hear proton, you can underline the P in proton and remind yourself that they are positively charged. So they have a positive charge to them. And you find them in the nucleus of an atom, meaning in the center portion of an atom. Next to them in that nucleus, you will also find neutrons. And just like their name suggests, these guys are neutral. They do not have an electric charge to them. Last one are electrons. And instead of being in the nucleus, electrons you'll find orbiting around the nucleus in what we call electron shells. So you can see that here, the little blue dots are the electrons orbiting around the nucleus, the nucleus being the center that has the protons and neutrons. Electrons are very, very important in chemistry because these are the subatomic particles with a negative charge. And these negative charges determine how atoms end up interacting with each other. Okay, so it ends up being the electrons that are either given to other atoms or taken from other atoms when atoms then want to react with each other. Now, when we talk about atoms, you'll get to see them arranged on what we call the periodic table in a minute. But for each atom, we distinguish them with an atomic symbol, an atomic number, and an atomic mass. And it's important to understand what each of these uh, numbers or symbols end up representing. So when you see atomic number, 
I want you to write down that that is the number of protons for that atom. So for instance, if I told you that carbon, which you see down here, has an atomic number of six, that would tell you that carbon has six protons. Now, if we said that that carbon atom was neutral, so neutral over here, if we said that that carbon atom was neutral, then that would tell you that it has the same number of protons as it has electrons, because the positives and the negatives would be equal to each other and cancel each other out. So if the atomic number were six for carbon and we said that it's neutral, that would tell you that in addition to six positively charged protons, that carbon would have six negatively charged electrons. Now, if I told you instead that it has a positive charge, that would tell you that it has lost some of its negative electrons. Because remember, in the previous slide, I said that it's electrons that leave or get um, gained. So when you see a plus or negative charge, it tells you whether there was a gain in negative electrons or a loss in negative electrons. If that atom is now more positively charged, think about it. If it's more positive, it lost negatives. So whatever the charge is, let's say it's a plus one, it would tell you that instead of being neutral, it lost one electron. So if carbon was, you were told it was a plus one charge, it would mean instead of six electrons, it lost one. So it only has five. If it was a plus two charge, instead of six electrons, it lost two. So now it's a, it would have four electrons instead of six. If instead you're told that it has a negative charge, okay, a negative charge would mean more negative. Well, what's negative in an atom? Electrons, right? So if it's more negative, it has more electrons. So if there's a negative one charge, it would tell you that it has one extra negative charge, one extra electron. So in that example of carbon, instead of six electrons, it would have one extra, which means seven. If you're told carbon has a minus two charge, then that would tell you two extra electrons. So you would go eight electrons instead of six, okay? If that's unclear to you, just send me a message and remind, and I will give you a little extra practice. Now, the last term that you encounter is atomic mass. And what atomic mass is, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And so when you are ever asked to find the number of neutrons of an atom, all you have to do is subtract the number of protons from the atomic mass. And what's the number of protons? That's the atomic number, okay? So in the case of carbon here, the atomic mass is 12. The number of protons, or the atomic number, is 6. So to find the number of neutrons, you would simply do 12 minus 6, which would be 6 neutrons, okay? If this carbon had an atomic mass of 13, you would do 13 minus 6, which would be 7 neutrons. Okay, So make sure you're very comfortable handling the uh, atomic number, atomic mass. I could, I could give you an atom where I would tell you what its mass number is, what its atomic number is, and then I can ask you, well, how many protons does it have? How many electrons? How many neutrons? Okay, and I would also give you the charge and then ask you those same questions. Okay. Now, like I mentioned a minute ago, we arrange atoms in what we call the periodic table. And this allows us to visualize and kind of um, gain valuable information about how they may be related to each other and whatnot. You have vertical columns, okay, so vertical columns going up and down. These are groups, okay, like it says here. So group one would be H all the way down to FR. Group two would be BE all the way down to RA. 
Okay, so the vertical columns are called groups and the horizontal rows are called periods. And what do you notice about the first period on a periodic table versus all the others? Well, that one differs in that it's the only one that has two elements in its period. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with what vertical columns are. They are the groups. And when we say period on a periodic table, we mean the horizontal rows. Now, sometimes you encounter what's called an isotope. Okay, so if we look at that carbon that we were talking about before, we saw that carbon normally has an atomic mass of 12 and an atomic number of six, which means it normally has six protons and six neutrons. If, however, you encounter an isotope of carbon, what that means is suddenly you see a different atomic mass. And if you have a different atomic mass, that tells you that now you have a different number of neutrons. Okay, so when you have an isotope, it means that you have the same element, but a different number of neutrons. So if I told you that you have an isotope of carbon with an atomic mass of 13, well, how does that differ from regular carbon? Well, now it has seven neutrons instead of six, okay? Because again, the way that you find the number of neutrons is you subtract the atomic number, which is the lower number, from the atomic mass, which is the bigger number, okay? How about this isotope over here? Isotope carbon-14. What I want you to do is once you get to this slide, send me a message in the Remind app telling me how carbon-14 would differ from carbon-12 and be very specific in your answer, okay? Just to check to make sure that you're watching the video and paying attention, okay? So please, once you get to this point, stop everything, get your phone out, and send me a message with how carbon-14 differs from carbon-12, okay? Now, when we talk about atoms, there are different models in terms of how they're arranged, how you can actually visually represent them. The Bohr model is now the most famous and most widely accepted a lot of times. It basically shows, like we mentioned earlier, the electrons circling the nucleus in these concentric circles. So that would be one electron shell, the next electron shell, and as they have more electrons, you end up having more and more of these concentric circles around them. Now, each of these circles or electron shells or orbitals will have a specific maximum number of electrons that they can have in that circle. The innermost circle, meaning this first ring around the nucleus, that can only have up to two electrons, okay? So make a note for yourself that the first electron ring can only have up to two electrons. The next ones will all have eight or multiples of eight, okay? So for our purposes, we'll only use the next ones as eight. So you can have two in the first shell, then up to eight in the next shell and up to eight in the next shell, okay? We also use another term describing the electron orientation, which is valence. If you're ever asked how many valence electrons an atom has, that means how many electrons does it have in its outermost ring? So for instance, hydrogen's outermost ring is this first ring, and it only has one there. So its number of valence electrons would be one. Phosphorus has multiple rings, but you go to the outermost ring, and that one has one, two, three, four, five electrons. So the valence electrons of that phosphorus drawing would be five. Now, 
these outermost electrons are very important because that determines how that element or how that atom will react with other atoms. So basically, an atom always wants its outer shell full to be happy. So if its outer shell is only the first shell, like in the case of hydrogen, it will either want to gain one electron or get rid of that one electron, right? So gain one electron, now I'm happy I have two. My, my outer shell is full. If you end up with one of the outer shells that's supposed to be eight, well, it can either have three or less electrons, or it could have five or more. And ask yourself, if you were an atom and you had, let's say, three or two electrons in your outer shell, well, what would it be easier for you to do? Your goal is to have eight in that outermost shell, right? So would it be easier for you to just get rid of, find someone to give two or one electron, or would it be easier to have to go and find five other electrons, right? Or six other electrons, seven other electrons to, to fill your shell? Well, it would be harder to find that many. So three or less, what will an atom do? It will donate. It tends to donate atoms because it's easier to get rid of three than to have to find five. Okay, or to get rid of two rather than having to try and find six electrons. Okay? The opposite of that is if an atom has five or more valence electrons, well, it's either going to want to get rid of, give away five, six, seven electrons, or try and find and obtain three, two, or one electrons. Well, what's easier, it's easier to receive electrons, to try and find just two, three electrons to fill your outer shell, rather than giving away all those ones you've already have. Okay? So basically, keep in mind if the valence electrons are three or less, we donate. If it's five or more, we want to receive electrons. Okay. Again, if that's any of that's unclear, just send me a message in Remind, and I'll explain it further. So, if an element has nine electrons, how would you draw it? Well, the first thing we would do, we're not worrying about the nucleus right now, so we'll just color that in. Okay. Now, the first thing you would do is the first ring can have a maximum of how many electrons? Well, one, two. Two electrons in the first ring. And then we would make the second one, and we would try and keep counting up until we hit nine. Now, I recommend putting them in the following order so that you can kind of help visualize when your orbital is full. So we have one, two. We would put the third one here, fourth one here, fifth one here, sixth one here, seventh one here, eighth one here, and ninth one. And now by doing it in that order, we made it up to our nine electrons, right? Because we counted one, two, and then we went three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And what do you notice? By drawing it in this manner, we can now clearly see that we have one space open in our valence shell if this atom wanted to gain another electron or if it were to um, want to react anywhere, okay? So by drawing it in this manner, it helps us to really um, better visualize, okay? Now, if you are unclear, again, how we figure that out, just send me a remind message. Now, I can ask you if you were to draw, a, draw an element that has nine electrons, how many electrons would be in the valence or the outer shell? And so you would have to know that you first put two in the center shell, and then the answer would be that you now, when you look at this picture, have seven in the outer shell.
है Now, the way you're more likely to encounter Adam questions or Adam practice is the following. Like I mentioned earlier, I can give you the charge of the atom. So it can either be minus number, like in this case, minus one, it could be a positive number, or I could just say neutral. I tell you the atomic number, which in this case, the atomic number is seven, and the atomic mass is 15. So I give you these three pieces of information, and then I could ask you things like how many protons? Well, how do you get the protons? The atomic number. So the number of protons here would be seven. I could then ask you how many neutrons? Well, how do you get neutrons? Take the big number and subtract the smaller number, okay? So you do atomic mass of 15 minus atomic number of seven, okay? So that would tell you that you would have eight, eight neutrons. Then, we could ask how many electrons. Well, to figure out the electrons, you're going to need the atomic number and the charge, right? Because electrons are negatively charged and you see that this atom has a minus one charge. That tells you that it is more negative, meaning it has more electrons than protons, which means that it has one extra electron above the number of seven protons. So that would tell you that it has eight electrons. Now I could even specify the, um, the electron shell or the electron configuration. So I could say, well, if it has, you, you just figured out that it has eight electrons. How many of those will be in the first electron shell? Well, you already know that the maximum is two. So two electrons would be in the first shell. I can then ask you, what's the electron configuration? So that would be just like the way you drew it before. So the first electron shell would have two electrons in it. So you would write two. And then the second one would have the remainder. So if you have two in the first one, you have eight total, then the second one would have six. And the way that you would see this written, let me switch over to the pen. The electron configuration would be two comma six, okay? Because there are two in the first shell and six in the second shell. And I could do questions where there's even more electrons above that as well. And you would have to then see, let's say two, eight, and then a, a number after that, okay? So make sure that you are very comfortable in terms of how to handle this type of practice because this is the exact format that you would end up seeing it on exam one. Now, if you would like more practice problems, just send me a message and remind asking, can you please send me a couple of extra Adam practice problems? And I have no problem doing that, okay? So now moving on from atoms, you saw in lecture one that when we do the hierarchy of organization or the basically levels of organization, once you put many different atoms together, you come up with a molecule, okay? And so a molecule is many atoms put together and it is the smallest part of a compound that still has the specific properties of that compound. Okay, so molecule, many atoms put together, and it is the smallest part of a compound that still has the specific properties of that compound. Okay, now sometimes you will see it written in the form of a molecular formula, and so that would be like here where you see sugar written out in its molecular formula. If you had a big number in front of this, so let me switch over to the pen, option. Let's say you had two, sorry, that's puppy, but two written in front of that molecular formula. That would tell you that there are two molecules of sugar. Okay. If, however, you see the subscripts, meaning these numbers, that tells you the number of that particular atom. So there are six atoms of carbon. There are 12 
atoms of hydrogen, okay? But if you have a number in front of the whole um, molecule or molecular formula, that tells you there are multiple of the molecule, which means if you had it written out like this, 2C6H12O6, that would now tell you how many carbons do you have? You have 12 because you have 6 times 2. How many hydrogens would you have? You would have 24 because you have 12 times 2. Okay, so that's just to help you if you see the molecular formulas written out, be able to identify uh, what those numbers actually tell you. Now, once you understand atoms, it's important to understand how they bond together, meaning how those atoms interact with each other to make those bigger molecules. There are three main categories of bonds. There are ionic, covalent, and hydrogen bonds. Now, ultimately, the way these three bonds are forming, like we mentioned earlier, is based on the electrons. Is an atom gaining electrons? Is it losing it? Is it sharing them? Because electrons, those negative charges, are really what all the atoms are interested in. Now, when you have the formation of these bonds or you have the breaking of them, we call those reactions. And we'll go over that more in later slides. Now, we're just going to briefly go through each of these types of bonds, the three types of bonds, and look at how they differ from each other. So ionic versus covalent versus hydrogen. The first type of bond is ionic bonds. And what I want you to remember with ionic bonds is you have the actual exchange of electrons. So one atom is gaining electrons and the other one is losing electrons. Now, why would they end up staying together if, you know, I already gained electrons, I'm happy, I'm full. Why would I stay with that atom near me that just lost the electrons? Well, because now by gaining electrons, I'm more negatively charged, right? And that other atom that just lost electrons, they're now more positively charged because they lost negatives, right? As you know, opposites attract. So even though I got what I wanted, I got those electrons, I'm going to stick with that other atom because now I'm attracted to that charge, that opposite charge. So that's why even though there's the exchange of electrons, the atoms stay together bonded because the opposites attract. Now there are two terms that I want you to be very comfortable with, and that's anion and cation. Okay, so when you have ionic bonding and one atom has gained electrons, the other has lost, you've now formed an anion and a cation. Okay. There's a trick that I always use to remember them. So an anion, I always underline that N and remind myself that that is the atom that's now negatively charged. And if it's negatively charged, what has happened to it? Well, it's negative because it has more negatives, which means it got electrons, which are negative. Okay. The cation, on the other hand, I always circle cat and I usually draw a little picture of a kitty cat because cats are well they're positive things they're adorable unless you're deathly allergic then I apologize but normally you think a cat you think oh my god that's so cute and so that's a positive thing right so cation is the atom that is now more positive and how would it be more positive because it lost those negative electrons right so remember that an anion is negative. It's an atom that has gained negative electrons, whereas a cation is positive because it's an atom that has lost electrons, okay? Circle, star, highlight those two terms. Make sure you write it in your notes because those always come back on exams. So now the next type of bond is covalent bonds. And the way that covalent bonds differ from ionic bonds is now instead of one of the atoms being strong enough to completely take the other atom's electrons, now instead they're both closer in strength, so they end up having to share the electrons instead. So covalent differs from ionic in that covalent bonds are ones in which the atoms are sharing 
electrons rather than completely donating or receiving. Now, there are three different forms of covalent bonds. They can be single, double, or triple, depending on the number of electrons being shared. So as you can see in this figure down here, you have a single covalent bond here. They're just sharing those regular two electrons. Here is a double covalent bond. They're sharing two different pairs of electrons. So now that's four. And here you have triple covalent. They're sharing three pairs of electrons. So they're sharing six electrons in total. Now with these types of uh, sharing is caring kind of bonds, covalent, there are two different categories of covalent bonds. There's nonpolar and there are polar covalent bonds. The way you can distinguish nonpolar and polar covalent bonds is that nonpolar bonds is an equal sharing. So picture this as the two atoms are very equal in strength. So they're both tugging at those electrons, as you can see in this little figure here, and the electrons stay in the middle evenly between the two atoms because they're both equal in strength. Whereas polar, when you think of polar, what do you think of polar opposites, right? Students I know always say polar bear if I'm not quick enough with that one. But yeah, you think of polar opposites. So there's a big difference in strength between those two atoms. And it's kind of like when you have two little kids and you force them to share a toy, but one of the kids really doesn't want to share it. So he's trying, he's pulling that toy a little closer to him. So that's a polar covalent bond where one of them, one of the atoms will be a little greedier and have the electrons closer to them. Now, water is an example of a polar bond, right? And that's very significant because like dissolves like. So when you see that water is polar, you know, switch to the pen, like dissolves like, meaning. So circle star, highlight that. Meaning that if water is polar, it will dissolve anything else polar, okay? And that will be very important because that will determine that anything polar is what we call hydrophilic, okay? It gets dissolved, it interacts very well with water. Anything nonpolar, will be hydrophobic because water will not like it, will not dissolve it, they will not interact well. Okay, so that's gonna keep coming back in, in later slides. So keep that in mind, water is polar, it dissolves other polar molecules. Okay, so in addition to writing like dissolves like, write down that water dissolves anything else that is polar. So the third type of bonding, in addition to covalent and ionic bonds, are hydrogen bonds. And the way hydrogen bonds form is the positive hydrogen atoms of one molecule will be attracted to the negative oxygen or nitrogen atoms of another. Now you see this a lot with water. So if you look at the water molecules lined up, there's the two partially positive hydrogens and then the negative oxygen, and so the negative oxygen will then be attracted to the next water molecule's hydrogens, and the hydrogens will be attracted to the next water molecule's oxygen. And you'll see how this ends up forming this massive network of bonds, and even though each individual hydrogen bond is weak, when you have many of them together, it could be very, very strong. And that's why you see things like the surface tension of water and you see a little bug walking on top of water. It's able to do that because of how many hydrogen bonds are present there. It's also really significant for DNA. So the fact that individual bonds are weak, but many together are strong is critical for the DNA structure because Hydrogen bonds are able to hold the two strands of DNA together when you need them together, and they stay together nicely, but the cell is also able to then break the bonds one by one in order to perform DNA replication.
or in order to express the genes that it needs to express. Okay, so that ends up being very important for life functions. So when we say why is it important for things such as DNA, it's important because the DNA is kept stable as a double strand, but the cell can individually break each bond, each hydrogen bond, to then perform replication or gene expression. Now, in addition to having those hydrogen bonds, water has a lot of crucial properties that you need to kind of have, have down pat. Now, first of all, water is what we call a solvent, which means that things can be dissolved into it. And like we mentioned earlier, that's due to its polar structure. So like dissolves like, water is a solvent that dissolves many polar uh, substances. There's also the terms solution and solute. So when you have that solvent that can dissolve things, once you put those substances in to dissolve, those substances are solutes and you've now made a solution. So a way to kind of think about this is if you have a water bottle, that water is a solvent because it's able to dissolve, let's say the salt that you are going to put into it. The salt that you put into it is the solute that gets dissolved in the water and you have now created a solution, which is salt water, okay? So the solvent was water, the salt was the solute, Together, you made a solution, which is salt water. You can think of the same thing with sugar water or even when you make, you know, chocolate milk. The milk is now the solvent. The Nesquik chocolate powder or whatever you like. I'm not doing an advertisement here. Um, the Nesquik chocolate powder is the solute. You put them together and now that chocolate milk is the solution. Another important aspect about water is if you've ever noticed Water in its ice form is less dense than liquid water, okay? So make sure how does frozen water compare to liquid water? Frozen water, aka ice, is less dense than liquid water, which is why you'll notice if you have a glass of water and you put ice cubes in it, where do the ice cubes go? They're floating on the top, right? Your ice cubes, even though they look like solid structures, they don't sink to the bottom. Okay, that's critical, the fact that ice is less dense than water, uh, than liquid water, because life on Earth would basically cease to exist if ice was heavier, because all of those waterways would end up freezing from the bottom up, meaning you would end up having ice, 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 going and all of the animals or the organisms living in all the waterways would die. The way it is now instead, waterways freeze from the top down, meaning you end up with just an ice layer on the top, but life can still survive below. So that's very critical to, to life existing is the fact that, you know, water in the frozen form is less dense. Another important aspect about water is that it's responsible for the formation and the breaking of bonds. So there are two terms I want you to know, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So for dehydration synthesis, if every single time you say it, you say the full word instead, the full term, sorry, instead of just saying dehydration, you say dehydration synthesis. Well, think about it. Dehydration means what? If you're dehydrated, you're lacking water, right? You've lost water. So dehydration synthesis means that molecules are formed, or bonds are formed when water molecules are lost, as you can see here. So that H2O, okay, that gets lost and now a bond is formed. Bonds can also be broken by water because doing the opposite, adding water, ends up breaking that bond open again. Okay, the way to think of that one, hydro hydrolysis, in biology, whenever you hear lysis or lice, that means breaking, bursting. So picture, you know, fire, fire hose, 
you know, the water spraying down uh, a whole bunch of objects, knocking them down with that force of water. So water can break bonds and removing water can build bonds. Now, other critical properties that I'm sure you've seen in action but never really may have known the terminology is the fact that water molecules are what we call cohesive and adhesive. What cohesion or being cohesive means is that water molecules cling to other water molecules very tightly. And that's important to having things like flowing water. The water flows because they're all stuck together. They like to stick close together. Then cohesion allows for the development of what we call surface tension as well. So that's what we were mentioning before, that strength in many water molecules, okay, because they start sticking together. Adhesion, on the other hand, is the fact that water molecules cling to other polar molecules very tightly. So things that are not water but are still polar, that's important for things such as plants and trees because plants rely on the properties of, of transporting water. They have to be able to move that water, you know, from the roots all the way to the leaves. And the way they're able to do that is by not only sticking the water molecules together through cohesion, but sticking to the lining of the, the plant cells through adhesion. OK, so when you see co think together water molecules and adhesion is sticking to other substances. Now, we've kind of already mentioned the terms that you're going to see on this slide. The fact that water is polar makes it very critical in, in cells and in all of life because we said like dissolves like. And so water molecules end up attracting and sticking with other polar molecules. And those molecules are then called hydrophilic, whereas the opposite are the nonpolar molecules that are hydrophobic because they don't like to interact with water. Now this is significant because now all of the cells and tissues in your body will arrange in a way to have hydrophilic molecules facing water and hydrophobic molecules will arrange to try and be protected away from water. So you see that with, for instance, your cell membranes that we'll talk about in later lectures. The hydrophilic parts will face the water environments and the hydrophobic parts will gather together and hide. Okay, so polar, nonpolar, hydrophilic, hydrophobic is important for the arrangement of molecules in your body and in the environment. Water also has what we call a high heat capacity. And what that means is that it holds on to its heat better than other liquids. Okay, and that basically means, in, in other words, more heat must be applied to water in order to raise its temperature. This is why it takes a while to boil water, right? So more heat must be applied to water in order to raise its temperature. That's very good for living things, right? Because think about it. If it didn't take much to raise the temperature of water, all of the animals and, and organisms living out in the water would basically die anytime the sunlight hit that water because it would instantly get too hot for them. Or even think of your own body. You're made up mainly of water. If, if you know, applying the slightest bit of heat suddenly raised the temperature of all your water, you would basically be walking around and then just instantly melting. Or you would have spontaneous combustion because you would just get way too hot and not, you know, be like, wow, he's really hot over there. No, it would be you are melting and exploding, basically. Okay, so it's important that water has high heat capacity because it makes it tough to raise the heat, which makes it very stable, okay? Very important for things living in water or things like us that are made up of water. Now, a similar term 
don't get confused with, similar term is high heat of vaporization. And as soon as you hear vaporization, that tells you evaporating, right? Going from liquid to gas. And what high heat of vaporization of water means is it takes a lot of energy to evaporate water. And I wrote this out in mathematical terms to kind of help you visualize this with calories being used as the amount of heat energy needed in this scenario. So to raise water from 98 to 99 degrees, meaning to raise it one degree there, it only takes one calorie of energy, right? To raise the water then another degree to 100 degrees, it takes one calorie. Now, to raise it from 100 to 101, which means evaporating, you now need to break a whole bunch of those hydrogen bonds, right, to go from a liquid to a gas. And we said a whole bunch of those bonds, that's going to take a lot of work and energy, right? Now it takes 540 calories to raise the water temperature from 100 to 101. So again, we're only going one degree like before, but now you're breaking bonds. And that takes a bunch of energy. And when you take that bunch of energy to do that, you also release a bunch of energy. And it's usually released in the form of heat. So it's getting rid of heat. That is why sweating cools, because of the high heat of vaporization. Not that the sweat, the liquid, having the liquid on you cools you. It's that when that sweat evaporates, it's taking a ton of energy and heat with it. And that cools you off. So if I ask what is, um, why does sweat cool you off? It's because of the high heat of vaporization of water, okay? This is just a visual to help you see what we were just talking about, that big jump in uh, calories, meaning that huge jump in energy and heat to turn water into a gas. Now the last now, the last thing I want to uh, talk about in this chapter is pH. We're not going to go into crazy detail because this is just intro bio. This is not a biochem class or anything. But what I do want you to know is that when water molecules break apart, okay, which we put there as ionizing, it's going to release hydrogen and hydroxy ions. Okay. Now, pH will then be a measurement of the concentration of hydrogen ions released there. Okay, so it's a measurement of the concentration of hydrogen ions. So that's these guys. Now, in order to kind of uh, represent this, we use the pH scale. The pH scale ranges from zero to 14, and we use the terminology of acidic versus basic. So for acidic, associate it with a lot of hydrogen ions, whereas basic will have fewer hydrogen, lots of hydroxy ions that it can release. Seven is your neutral on the pH scale. Anything lower than that will be considered acidic, and anything higher than seven will be considered basic, like a lot of people I know. Okay, so we're just going to go a little more into acids and bases. So acids, like we just mentioned, acids have high H plus concentrations, meaning high hydrogen ion concentrations. And they release hydrogen ions when they break down or break apart in water. So an example is HCl, hydrochloric acid. If you break that down, it's going to release H plus hydrogen ions, as well as the chloride ions. Now you can also have bases, which instead, like I said before, have low hydrogen ion concentrations, and they will instead release hydroxy ions. So that's the OH that you see over here. Okay, so when you see H plus being released upon breakdown, that was an acid. When you see OH being released, that is a base. Now, when you mix an acid and a base, you'd be like, wow, that's scary. Why are you doing these things? What's going to happen? You make a salt. 
Okay, so when you mix an acid and a base, you make a salt, which is represented here very nicely. How you now have you if if you look at the acid breaking up into water, well, you got the H plus and the Cl. When you had the NaOH break up into water, you got the Na plus and OH. You can put those Na plus and Cl together to make a salt, and then the OH and the H makes water. Look at that, you got salt water from that acid and base. So when you mix an acid and a base, you get a salt. Now, when we talk about acids and bases, if you pictured your body being made up of a whole bunch of acids and bases, that might be a problem if there was nothing else to help keep a balance with that pH. So that's why you also need to have buffers existing. And the purpose of buffers is to keep pH within normal limits, okay? So if you think about it, when H plus ions or hydrogen ions are added to pure water, so we have that here, H plus added to water, the water becomes acidic, right? Because we said associate H plus with acids, OH, what do you associate them with? Hydroxy ions you associate with bases. So if you add OHs to pure water, then now you would end up with a pH that's more basic, which we say as alkaline, okay, alkaline. Now buffers now resist those changes in pH. So for instance, if you're putting an H plus into water, and you now have a buffer there, the buffer may either absorb the hydrogen ions or counter by adding those basic hydroxy ions, okay? So when H plus is added, what might a buffer do? Either absorb the H plus or counter it by adding OH minus. When OH minus or hydroxy ions are added, what might the buffer do? Well, it would either absorb the OH minus or counter with what? What counters and neutralizes the OH minus? Add some H plus, okay? So the buffers will neutralize and balance the solution and resist the change in pH. A very important example of a buffer that does that is the bicarbonate ion. And what the bicarbonate ions help do in, in your body, if you think about it, you're constantly taking in food and having metabolic processes that will alter your pH if there's nothing to help with that, right? So for instance, certain foods and metabolic processes might end up um, increasing your blood pH to 7.8 or higher. Now that would be a problem, right? Because now it's more basic and basic we call alkaline, right? So we call that alkalosis and that would be life-threatening because now your blood would be the wrong pH. Same thing happens if food and metabolic processes were to suddenly lower your pH. And what do you know about lower pHs? Lower is acidic. So that would give you acidosis. Again, you don't want your blood acidic. You don't want it boiling up and, and acid burning everything in your body, all those tissues and all. So that would be life-threatening. So instead, you have what's called bicarbonate ions in your body, which in the blood buffers the pH to 7.4. And like we said in the previous slides, buffers can either absorb the extra ions, so absorb the hydrox, uh, hydrogen or hydroxy ions, or they can counter by adding the opposite ion, okay? So you end up avoiding acidosis or alkalosis, okay? So increasing blood pH to 7.8, you can write this word here, alkalosis. Reducing blood pH to 7.0 results in acidosis. Either one is a problem, so how does the body protect against these? The answer is bicarbonate ions, okay? Protect against alkalosis and acidosis in the blood. Now, 
you'll notice if you're going based on the textbook that it has all the information about carbon at the end of this chapter, but I think that fits better with chapter three. So I am separating that into chapter three. So you can take your break now, do whatever you like, make sure you are keeping track of jotting down your study guide. So by now you should have had your study guide written for chapter one and now chapter two you can write. And also, as we go through each of these chapters, think about what questions you will want to post on this week's discussion board, which you have to post on the discussion board by the end of the week. Okay, I'll send out a reminder to help you guys stay on track with that. Okay, any questions you have, hit, hit up that Remind app to ask anything, including for practice problems, or if you want to see if you're on the right track with your study guide or discussion questions. Thank you and have a great day.